Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, Amtrust Title Insurance Company, Perfect Building Maintenance, M&T Bank, Customers Bank, Marks Paneth LLP, Capital One Bank, Collins Building Services, Meridian Capital Group. Additional support has been provided by grants from AKA Hotel Residences Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, Amarant Bank, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, Chase Commercial Mortgage Lending, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Citizens Bank, Dime Community Bank, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties LLC, Handler Real Estate Organization, Hodges Ward Elliott INC, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Casamitidis Red Apple Group, Keysight Capital Partners, Matone Group, New Banks, Newmark Knight Frank, Ocean First Bank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Services, Stonehenge NYC, SVN CPEX Real Estate Services, Tierra CRG, the Meringo Family Foundation, and these friends. called Only Brooklyn, and the reason it's called Only Brooklyn is because my executive producer, Ofa Cohn, decided to call it Only Brooklyn and bring Only Brooklyn people to talk about what's happening in the best borough of the city. I may be biased because I was born and bred in Brooklyn. My guests include Dave Lombino, who is the managing director of Two Trees, Jared Delavella, who is the co-founder and CEO of Alloy Development, David Ehrensberg, who is the president of the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation, otherwise known as the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And last but not least, the infamous executive producer, the founder and CEO of Terra CRG, Ofa Cohn. So since you've assembled this, I'm just sitting here as the <laughs> intermediary. Why only Brooklyn? Isn't there Queens, Staten Island, the Bronx, and Manhattan? You know, everybody is going to have their own version of the story. Uh, but for me, it was very, I mean, for me, when I, when I, first time I walked into um, looking at some properties in Brooklyn in 2003, 2004, it was, uh, you know, it was a uh, love at first sight. I mean, I, I kind of felt that this is a place where as a young entrepreneur or as someone that, you know, wants to build something, there's a real, real, real true opportunity. And I, this was 15 years ago, but I, I, I still believe that people coming to Brooklyn feel the same trajectory. So it's interesting because you really have three builders over here in different ways, okay? We have the Navy Yard, which was rebuilt, okay? We have many developments in Brooklyn, including an electric building over there being done, which we'll, we'll ask you about. And then we have the visionaries who've been in Dumbo, Williamsburg, and everywhere else in Brooklyn, the Two Trees people. So how do you decide to build this new huge building on Flatbush Avenue? Yeah, it, it, the, uh, the site on Flatbush is really at the intersection of, of Brooklyn, right in the middle of five neighborhoods and at the second largest transportation hub in, in the United States. So the, the location is, is fairly obvious for us and it really is the center of Brooklyn. It's, it's hard to deny the sort of potency and power of the, the brand of Brooklyn many corporations would die to have the branding potential <laughs> that Brooklyn has at this, at this moment in time. And to Offer's point, over the last 15 years, Brooklyn has really become not an alternative to New York City, but a destination in its own right. And uh, it has its own, its own sensibilities. Are there still opportunities to build and develop in Brooklyn? I mean, because the land is being absorbed. 
you know, downtown Brooklyn didn't have this development 15 years ago. It's taken place over the period of time. Where can you have an opportunity today? Um, yes, I mean, we see um, nearly unlimited potential in commercial development for the kinds of companies that we are trying to cater to um, at the yard. And uh, on a more, you know, on a broader basis, you know, Brooklyn is one of the largest, if it was its own independent city, it'd be one of the largest cities in the country. And if you look both in terms of the residential density and the commercial density, I think there is a very long way to go for, for Brooklyn to continue to develop. So let, let's talk a little bit of what's happening in the yards recently. I mean, one of the major developments that took place recently was the opening of Wegmans. Mm -hmm. Wegmans, everybody loves. It's one of the highest rated supermarkets in the, in the country. Uh, their employees love working over there. Talk about Wegmans. Um, yeah, so for us, you know, Wegmans, I think really goes to the heart of what makes Brooklyn so dynamic and interesting right now as a kind of microcosm. It is the highest quality grocery store in the country and it's also the most affordable. So when we walk into Brooklyn, we see, when I go there shopping, I see kind of all of Brooklyn and all of the diversity that continues to make Brooklyn so compelling for, for both residents and more and more on a commercial basis. It's that diversity of the workforce that I think is compelling. Um, so you've got you know, a grocery store that all in one is serving the higher income residents of Brooklyn as well as lower income residents and people have been, been in the community for a long time. I think that kernel that still makes Brooklyn special is what we want to see preserved and I think is part of the kind of gestalt or sensibility that Brooklyn has that in many ways Manhattan um, and certainly many neighborhoods in Manhattan has, has lost. David, let's talk about uh, how a company takes a sugar factory and converts it into a community and a park. We're working right now uh, on, on, on converting the refinery, which is the landmarked building at the center of the Domino Sugar Factory site, uh, into a 500,000 square foot office building. Um, this comes on top of opening Domino Park uh, 18 months ago, uh, which is a six acre waterfront park just north of Williamsburg Bridge. We've had um, two million visitors in just 18 months. So I guess the answer is you know, we did the park up front. Um, Williamsburg is a destination in its own right, but this was a site that hadn't had people on it, uh, you know, at what was, was fenced off uh, as a working sugar factory until 2005. So we opened up a waterfront park, invited the public in. They came in, in great numbers, and then since then we've been opening up residential and commercial assets along. along. You know, there, there was a perception that when the L train construction took place that Brooklyn was going to die, the Williamsburg. That hasn't happened, correct? Well, they also changed, uh, the, the, they changed the program. But right, but uh, I think there was a concern that a long um, duration of uh, construction that would completely halt uh, the L train between certain stops, um, it's going to hurt continued demand for residential and retail. But as soon, the moment that it was announced that they would do it on nights and weekends, you know, the concession, the rental concessions went down. Right, because many down. of the landlords at that time were planning this and they were trying to get the space rented at any price so they wouldn't have a problem. And due to the nights and weekends, this helped over there. Let's talk about your development, which I do want to talk about the new building because I think it's really unique, especially with the school education in there, the component plus the nonprofit. Yeah, so we're, we're building uh, approximately a million square foot development, which is a full city block at the intersection of Flatbush, State, and Third. And uh, ultimately, it's meant to uh, be incredibly inclusive, right? It's our, our obligation as the development community to consider all of the changes in Brooklyn and to make places feel uh, comfortable for everybody. And so the overall program for the project includes... Uh, several hundred units of affordable housing. It includes two public schools, one of which is for the Khalil Gibran Academy. It's a dual language Arabic speaking high school. We have a cultural component we plan on giving away. And coupled with that, we've taken a very progressive view on sustainability issues by proposing both the first all electric skyscraper in the borough in addition to the first passive house schools in New York City. And you know, at the end of the day, we're making cities. Uh, the experiences that um, we offer need to be fair, right? We need to create healthy cities, and we really need to think about how design can be the great democratizer of those experiences and of those places. And so, you know, we're, we're not making cupcakes, as my business partner says, we're making cities. They last for hundreds of years, and uh, we need to lead. We need to lead our industry in thinking through how to make for better places. So 
decarbonizing or thinking about a decarbonized future and eliminating fossil fuels is an important part of our message and what we think Brooklyn stands for and how we think ultimately the demographics will choose on where to live. We were talking earlier in, this, in the green room about retail in Brooklyn. Let's talk a little bit about that from everybody's point of view. Sure. The, the Apple and the Whole Foods at, at 300 Ashland, that, that was, I think we saw the same potential in that site than, than Jared uh, did across the street at 80 Flatbush, which is, it's, it's really the epicenter of, uh, of Brooklyn in terms of transportation connections um, and, 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 and street, and eventually uh, uh, street um, traffic. The, um, Normally, you know, it, we don't rely on, on retail or we don't look to retail on our waterfront properties as, as big money makers. I think the, the, the site at 300 Ashland was, was different and we saw an opportunity there to, to score some, some big names and we actively went after Apple and Whole Foods before the building was even built in order to get them there. But generally on the waterfront, we don't see um, a, a, big, you know, a big opportunity in retail. Retail for us on the waterfront in Williamsburg and in Dumbo, to a certain extent, is really a, as an amen, a, a neighborhood amenity that draws people into uh, into the area. Ofer, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, we had this conversation earlier, and Jared mentioned that uh, three out of the ten most active, the top retail corridors in the country are in Brooklyn. And I think people forget that Brooklyn, it's its own, I mean, it has the, the, the capacity and the density and demographic of a full city. I mean, you travel around the country or even around the world, and you, you think about you know, places like Detroit and Paris as, as cities, and then you come to Brooklyn and you realize that 2.6 million people and the public transportation and the diversity of ethnicities and languages and, and, and just, um, you know, cultural differences make so much impact. And so some of the best performing retail stores, big box retail stores even, are in Brooklyn. Let's talk about the office tenants in Brooklyn. Because you're looking for office tenants you have significant office mm -hmm. tenants, and you have incubators and certain other things. Um, yeah, so we, we at the Navy Yard cater to a kind of next generation manufacturing tenant base, uh, but the um, lines between manufacturing companies, design companies, and technology companies are, are blurring just like they are in the rest of the economy. Uh, and we see an extraordinary upsurge in interest from companies, both small and certainly medium size and kind of trending towards larger companies to be in Brooklyn. Again, not, just like in residential a couple of years ago, not just because rents are cheaper than Manhattan, but because it is where they, want, they think their workforce is, the kind of culture, the kinds of buildings that they aspire to as a company. And so we you know, don't have a lot of pure tech companies, but, um, you know, we used to have a sugar packing company at the Navy Yard as well, and they were a major tenant of ours for many years, a lot of jobs, and they recently gave us back 300,000 square feet of space, which is not a small amount of, of property for us to repurpose. And um, one of the tenants that has gone in there, which I suspect is gonna be similar to the kinds of tenants that Two Trees ultimately finds um, at the Domino Sugar Factory, is a nanoscale microscope company where the microscopes are powered by artificial intelligence and do quality, quality control and assurance on uh, pharmaceuticals and microchips and the like. And so you go from a relatively low value add, long standing corporate citizen in, in Brooklyn to really a next generation um, kind of company, but they're attracted to the bones of the building, they're attracted to the community that's been built, and they wanna be in Brooklyn because the founders live in Brooklyn and they know that they can get that um, top engineering talent in Brooklyn. With regard to rents, you're, you're lower than some of the parts of Brooklyn. Um, uh, for our manufacturers, we try to set rents at levels that they, that they can afford, and that right. is lower than office users because you've got big pieces of equipment that take up a lot of space and right. logistics. Um, but we do have a number of office um, tenants as well where we charge market rents. Um, but and again, what is market rents today at the Navy Yard? Um, at the Navy Yard for office, it tends to be in the 30s. Um, but what attracts them to the yard, again, is not just the rents. It, that's no, not have, nothing. You have the ferry, you have the other amenities. Yeah, and, but you also have the young workforce. And we this is a conversation I have with prospective tenants all the time is, go back to your offices and map where your young rising stars live. And I guarantee you, they live in a swath around the Navy Yard from Dumbo to Williamsburg to Bed-Stuy, Clinton Hill, Fort Greene. And there has not been one of those conversations that hasn't ended with the company owner coming back and saying, 
Well, I had no idea. Um, and, and then they tend to take Brooklyn very, very seriously. I think David is being very humble. I think uh, the tremendous amount of effort that him and his team put into development of the last five years and several projects, the minute you walk into the Navy Yard, you feel the tremendous amount of energy and you just want to be there. And I mean, it happens to, you know, companies that come from other markets, but it also comes, you know, to entrepreneurs. I mean, uh, the, a good story is uh, Lafayette 148 uh, that, you know, she fell in love, uh, Deirdre Queen. I mean, she fell in love with, with the Navy Yard before Building 77 was finished. Right. And now it's completely full, it's a million square feet. And she moved to 150 employees from Soho to the yard and... Yeah, and it's a 100,000 square foot lease, so it's a big lease, and then she actually moved across the street. She had lived in Manhattan and she moved... Yeah, and, and their facility is a, is a really nice combination of design, sound manufacturing, and office. So. Well, the truth of the matter is that Wall Street is no longer the primary economic driver in the city, right? Technology is, and the Tammy Industries, and a large proportion of those that workforce, to your point, David, are, live in Brooklyn, and the nature of the number of companies, the sheer quantity of companies that are being incubated or started in Brooklyn speaks to the potential of that commercial market because a lot of the startups and, and otherwise in Brooklyn live in Brooklyn. So it might not be the 500,000 square foot lease, but the 5,000, 8,000, 10,000 square foot lease is really provocative, especially when you have access to transportation. We just finished, uh, we just finished a study with the Center for an Urban Future um, that just got released that found that Brooklyn's, we had two really interesting findings among others. Uh, Brooklyn's creative economy is the fastest growing creative economy in the country um, by a pretty significant amount. And it is also one of, and among the, the large creative clusters um, within the city, it is the most diverse um, in terms of its employee base. I think, again, that the energy of the creative economy and the kind of return of talent to Brooklyn um, is part of the story, but the diversity of that talent is um, also a real, a real driver for, our, for the companies and relatedly for their employees and where they want to live. They don't want to live in, um, in Manhattan. Uh, I have a lot of friends who are you know, climbing the ladder at their creative companies um, and are soon to be in very senior roles, and none of them aspire to a corner office in Manhattan. They See, all at, want one, to at one time, Brooklyn was the low-cost alternative for office, residential, and so on. Retail was always there in Brooklyn in certain corridors, but over there. Let's talk about the Gowanus, okay? That's, a, that's an opportunity in Brooklyn, depending on things. How do you see the Gowanus? Well, uh, the city has been working, the city and the local council have been working on a, on a very uh, comprehensive framework uh, to rezone uh, a big chunk of the Gowanus. Um, that plan has been worked on for many, many years, and it seems to be on, on track to be, uh, to be finalized before the end of this administration. We've been seeing, um, it's interesting because the Gwanis is was historically a very industrial neighborhood and before it's getting rezoned, there was all these interesting new kind of, kinds of uses. I mean, one of my favorite places to go to is the Royal Palm Shuffleboard. But the point is that that became kind of a playground and it became like a place where people come to play over the week, you know, over the weekends and at night and now when the plan uh, uh, to rezone the area is, is, is finally uh, coming to fruition, we're going to see some interesting large-scale mixed-use uh, projects coming. You know, when you're talking about uh, entertainment, you know, there is an entertainment zone in Brooklyn that people only use in the summer, the spring. What's your thoughts about Coney Island? I think the success Water? of Coney is related to the set success of commercial office in Brooklyn, right? If you continue to see um, growth at the Navy Yard, growth in downtown Brooklyn, um, where, you know, and, and additional companies locating in Brooklyn, I think Coney Island becomes uh, more viable as a residential um, opportunity. Uh, I think the commute from Coney into Midtown by mass transit is a nightmare and is not likely to, you know, and, and that, that continues to be a, a you know. An, so a, here, here's an important question. How, how important has the ferry system been in the growth and development of Brooklyn? Uh, I, I, for us, it's been absolutely critical. Um, you know, it, it moves, we are the third most active ferry stop outs, outside of Manhattan. Um, we opened it last, last year and 
Um, it's been a really vital link, really mostly to, to Manhattan. You're eight minutes from lower Manhattan, 14 minutes um, from Midtown. It doesn't move the same volume of people as the bus and, and subway system, obviously, but as that critical link um, for you know, your once a week meeting in Midtown, it has proved really, really important for our tenants. Your thoughts? I think what's interesting about the waterfront in general in Brooklyn is that to a degree we're gonna surpass people's expectations for uh, change on the waterfront, which is I think the perception a decade ago or 15 years ago was that all of the waterfront would become residential and that as an industrialized city, our history turned its back on the waterfront in general. And so the Williamsburg and Greenpoint Green, Green rezoning really started to suggest a shift along with Dumbo. Now what we're seeing is industry is actually going to pass by residential yet again. And the working waterfront and the amount of investment in, in industrial Brooklyn over the next decade or two, uh, as proven by the Navy Yard and certainly in Sunset Park and other areas like that are really the remarkable story of, of the waterfront in Brooklyn in my mind, which is residential had its moment, but I think that moment's gonna pass for industry again. What about uh, Bushwick, Greenpoint and Red Hook? You know. These are emerging neighborhoods, changes. How do you see that, David? I, I think Greenpoint is well on its way uh, to, to being a mature residential market. Uh, um, and I, I think the ferries have definitely helped Greenpoint also. The ferries have helped. And, 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 re and residential, I think, in the rental market citywide, re tenants are, residents are, are now, I think, they're accepting kinds of commutes that they wouldn't, or they wouldn't, have 10 years ago. So, so Greenpoint is actually quite close to Midtown. Um, it, uh, Greenpoint is, is not as pretty easy to get to Union Square. Um, you know, there, uh, and, and I think you'll see uh, a lot of demand there, um, you know, as Williamsburg continues to develop, that will, that will move, that will move north. What about Red Hook? Red Hook is interesting. I mean, you know, we always thought that the waterfront of Red Hook um, is going to become uh, a you know sort of like a great destination for more office and sort of industry development but it hasn't taken place yet and and i think what ended up happening last year which is you know uh it is what it is is ups committed to a big chunk of the waterfront there with, to build one of the largest facilities in the five boroughs and i think with that as an anchor sort of on one side and ikea on the other end it's going to take some time and I think the city and, and hopefully in the next administration would have to kind of take a little bit more of a holistic approach to the area. And how do you now combine these big anchors with some thoughtful development? What about Dumbo? Any, any more opportunities to develop? I mean, the Too two expensive. of you. There's a 25. <laughs> uh, I mean, it used to be a uh, lower cost alternative, you know, nice water, nice uh, views and everything. A lot of condos uh, in the pipeline for Dumbo. None of none, uh, we're, we're we're satisfied with our footprint in that neighborhood. We're, our future is in Williamsburg, maybe in Gowanus. But um, there's a you know I think there there are at least a thousand units of of, of, of condominium housing uh, you know in the pipeline one or two years. So now. I think none of you are really condo developers. Okay, do you think Brooklyn can absorb the the number of units in development in the condo market? I think so. I think the um, you know the the quality that people are delivering is different, and I I refer to Brooklyn as this kind of want economy now rather than uh, an economy that is about an, a lesser alternative. And we've been drawing a circle around Lower Manhattan and Northwest Brooklyn for a long time relative to where we see the future of value creation, and people are choosing that as a home. And even with the number of units coming on in Dumbo. The econometrics around tourism in Brooklyn as it relates to something like Brooklyn Bridge Park where you get 250,000 unique visitors a weekend in season is fairly staggering. And so the demand is there and certainly the demographics can support the condominium. We've just never been in a moment where a neighborhood as small as Dumbo has had multiple projects at the same time. So I sort of equate it to downtown Brooklyn when there were 3,000 rental units coming on all at once. They all absorbed much faster than people anticipated. I think the demand is stratospheric. The population growth has been several hundred thousand people in the last decade, which is like adding another city. So. What about the Fulton Street Mall? 
Fulton Street Mall is 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 the you know is probably one of the strongest retail corridors in Brooklyn and, and, and the city. It's continuing to grow. City Point has been doing really really well. The amount of traffic on the Fulton Mall has changed uh, as the demographic in the neighborhoods is changing and the more density is being created. But it's 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 quite remarkable. What about downtown Brooklyn, the condominiums and the residential rentals, the new ones being built? How do you think they'll be? Absorbed? There's really, you know, I mean, it. I it, mean, you have 11. Homes. Most of the most of the inventory that was developed in downtown Brooklyn or in Brooklyn in general over the last decade has been multifamily rental apartments, and still, I, it, it looks like it's a lot of units that are being developed as condominiums, but it's a drop in the bucket. It, it's not enough to uh, kind of change uh, or or oversupply. Hospitality in Brooklyn. The hotel business. I remember it took Josh Muss 20 years to open up the Marriott, okay, and he was the only place, and now you probably have close to 40 hotels in Brooklyn. Well, city planning uh, created a new legislation a year and a half ago that prevents uh, future development of hotels in M zone areas, and so that put uh, uh, a restriction that prevents more, a lot more development to happen. So now there's very few corridors that you can actually build hotels and they can tell you about the hotel that they own. I mean, your hotel is one of the best hotels in Brooklyn. We started, thank you, we, we, st we were kind of a pioneer in, in Williamsburg Greenpoint. Um, several others followed. I think you see an enormous amount of tourism um, and people increasingly want to stay, stay outside the central business district. And I think Brooklyn is, is hot and people want to be um, in a different neighborhood. I'd like to thank David Ofocone, Dave, Jared, and I'll see you next week.